Okay. All right. Now it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. A little bit of technical difficulty. It's all good. So I guess we'll just start off again. I mean, sure. Um, obviously, I follow you on Instagram. Uh, we'll go through all that and. That's how I kind of got your contact and noticed yeah. all the cool things you did. And I, you were talking before the recorder issue here just now about uh, all your restaurants and stuff. So I guess go ahead and take us through that, like the beginning, what yeah. was the first restaurant sure. and so on and so uh, forth. 2007, I opened up Veritas Wine and Bistro, which is my flagship restaurant still to this day. Uh, focus on a higher end, um, you know, upper casual, uh, gourmet international fair basically it's uh, american cuisine with uh, a lot of emphasis on a uh, european and asian flair and uh, spices uh and then back in 2010 decided to open up a food truck which was the name america's favorite food truck by food network in 2011 uh and it is the first food truck to be entered into texas a&m university campus as well and we are still operating on campus and in 2014, we opened up New York-style Italian restaurant called Paolo's Italian Kitchen. And 2016, we acquired Madden's Casual Gourmet in downtown Bryan from dear friend Peter Madden, who runs a Mad Taco brand uh, down in Bryan College Station area. And just this year, 2019, we opened up the Urban Table. Uh, and between acquisition of the Madden's and the Urban Table, uh, we were named... Uh, uh, you know, official caterer for Association of Former Students at Texas A&M University. We do about 200 events for them a year, uh, and basically representing uh, and echoing uh, the core value of a Texas A&M University through food and uh, dining service uh, uh, through their important VIPs and uh, faculties. <laughs> That's so much stuff. And it, just to point out so everybody can know, you also are on the board at at the chamber, chamber right? yeah, Bryan College Station Chamber of Commerce. I'm a, I'm on an executive committee member, uh, so I help out with some memberships, and also I'm a board of director. Uh, actually, my term actually will come out October this year. So, but it's been great three years uh, of service, and I got to go to Washington D.C. Uh, for the federal wow. legislative action plan, and that was just fantastic to visit. You know many many members of Congress and a secretary uh, secretary of education uh, house speaker of the house I mean you know a <laughs> uh, little little Korean boy who immigrated to America <laughs> get to see number three in the country that, that's pretty awesome I was so. about to ask you like where, where are you actually from and I'm yeah, born and raised in Seoul Korea uh, and then I moved to stateside when I was 13 and the uh, reason I moved to stateside was uh, I came to visit my grandparents who actually immigrated earlier in 87 went to come visit them during summer break and noticed the elementary school had grass my school <laughs> in Korea did not have grass it was all clay court so I was like hey granddad is all elementary school in America has grass like yeah you should see high schools and I thought it was a junior college so big <laughs> So I told my parents, I said, hey, I, I want to I go to America and study. You know, again, the, one of those uh, classic American dream, right? I, I saw how America was, how, you know, I saw how big the airports were. And I'm like, you know what? Everything is just larger and grander uh, in America, and I want to be part of it. So I told my parents, I'm going to move. Uh, and they like, you don't speak any English. I said, I learned. So the deal was if I get all A's, I stay. I don't, I get yanked back. And I stayed, obviously, because I was very much committed on staying in America. So uh, I excelled through school um, because I really had zero social life. <laughs> so <laughs> it did help. So if you want kids, if you're, your kids, if you want your kids to be successful, I guess they got to have a little less social life. Uh, if they got too much social life, they might not do so well in their school. But then again, you got to have a balance. Um, I wish I had a little bit more social life because. Uh, my youngest kid is uh, really a social butterfly, and I actually want him to, you know, continue that, you know, while still, you know, successful in a school. But, uh, you know, life got to have a balance. Uh, I think I was a little one-sided. Uh, I was really book smart, but I was not street smart. <laughs> so <laughs> it will get you to college by being a book smart, but it won't get you any further than that. So <laughs> that's one thing. That's that is one thing that I I love about seeing. We have three kids. And I love seeing the differences between them and personalities all different. Yeah, and seeing some that are like 
really like street smart, like mm-hmm. you said. You can just tell they're, they the wheels are turning, and they're very wise in yeah. that sense. And that almost seems smarter sometimes than book smart. I think so. I, you know, it, it's not what you know. I, I have learned to understand that it's who you know. And uh, the networking, social networking, that's all very important uh, for you to be successful because uh, what you know is so limited compared to the whole grand scheme of things. If you know somebody who also knows as much but in different sector, you guys can build a synergy. And uh, that's exactly how we get our operation going. A lot of people ask me, like, how do you do six operation? I said, well, I have a right people on a right position who has a different strength than me and covers my weakness and my strength covers their weakness. I mean, that's really the simple answer. I mean, a lot of people just can't believe I get to do all this. I'm like, yeah, I just got to have a right personnel on the, on the position. That's all. So just uh, and so when did you develop the trust? Because just being involved in family business either, you know, you can't be at all six places at no. once. No. So when does that like hey that's my baby i gotta let that go this part go to somebody else did that ever pull on you like give you a tug of like man? well it's it's hard I mean, even to this day it's hard because um you know all these restaurants i either opened it up you know from ground up or i purchased it but you know had certain amount of uh, emotional investment into it where I want to make sure I see it succeed. It has my name attached to it. So there is a lot of responsibility and accountability that goes with it. But at the same time, you cannot do it all. You cannot do it all. That's, that's a fact of the matter. So, you know, it is very important that I show our team, you know, right leadership and I lead by example and then make sure that they follow what I try to do. And these people who are in a right position to do things for me, they're not just literally parachuted into the position. They had to work for me for a certain amount of time just to get vetted. Uh, people can fake it for a couple of weeks, couple of months, uh, but you can't fake it over the long term. You know, I, I'm looking for the consistency. If this person is genuinely improving, uh, you know, do they buy into my culture? Do they buy into my philosophy? And if they are doing it and they're making an improvement, even if it was a small increment, I'll buy into them as well. But if they're not, then I know they're not the right person. There are a few people who have progressed through our ranks a little bit faster than others just because they had such immense talent uh, and it was really obvious that they can handle it. That's great, you know, but there are some people who've been here on a very steady pace and steadily uh, getting improved on it. And obviously it means a lot for me that one, they're loyal to me, two, uh, they're making an improvement, so they're trainable. And three, they care, you know, they give a damn about it. So those are the people who we try to put in a right position. And uh, we also do show uh, other people, hey, this is how you can get up to that next level. If you can invest your time and then, you know, be steadfast about how to get to that next step, you will get it. So they are sort of the living example to the younger generation or the newer staff. Hey. You guys have an opportunity. You guys have a chance to get up through that rank so long as you do follow what I ask you to do. So it, it's been good. It's been good. I mean, I got a couple staff who's been with me 12 and a half years from the day one. Man, it's uh, a long time. It's a long time, business. long time. Absolutely. And then I got two guys been <clears throat> with me basically nine plus years. Uh, and then Jeez. basically all the original staff from Paolo's five years ago that we opened, they're all there. So that says a lot about, you know, showing the younger guys, hey, a lot of people stay here because they know it is really a good place to be. And a lot of people stay here because they see a steady improvement within their talent and within their pay rate as well. So, you know, people don't want to be stuck on a one one story where they cannot get out of it. You know, there's no movement. But by opening different restaurants, I was able to show them, hey, you know, if you made a, let's say, number four on on this rank, you know, power rank, right, in this (laughs) restaurant. But there's only so much you can go up as long as the top three doesn't move, right? Then we can give them an opportunity. Okay, I'm going to open up a new restaurant. You can go there as a number three guy and see if you can move up to number two. And then later on, hey, I'm opening another restaurant. This is your chance to go up to number two guy and see if you can go to number one. And progressively, that's how all of our executive chefs became executive chef. 
So, it's, it, you know, they know I try to take care of them. Uh, sometimes it doesn't happen as fast as I want it. Uh, but again, I'm <laughs> running on a very limited fund. So it's not like I have a you know, huge million dollar uh, bankroller. It doesn't happen that way. So they see it. I told them they saw it happening. So they now believe into it. So, you know, hopefully within the next two years, I'll do another restaurant, you know, and hopefully that's going to give another opportunity for our existing staff to promote. And eventually somebody's going to have to oversee two to three restaurants as a multi-unit manager because I cannot oversee six, seven, eight restaurants, you know, all, all at one time. I mean, just do the math. You know, I, I have to start divide myself too much. So I'm going to start dividing my time to say two to three key multi-unit managers and uh, multi-unit chefs and they're going to be dividing their time half and half to two restaurants so you know we don't have any um, you know downgrade on a quality and the systems and things like that so it's interesting to hear you talk about how like the you care almost just so much about the people that are running it as you do about the restaurant which you is have to. it's kind of odd in this business though is it? <laughs> I, want, I don't want to say odd. Um, it's unique for sure. You know, the people I dealt with, obviously, number one comes their business and that's their baby. You know, and it's, it's at no fault of them, but the people just kind of come and go. And they're, and they're like, if you, you do what I say, then you're doing your job. And, it, mm. you know, your attitude is like, you want to see these people succeed. Well, You've got other restaurants yeah. and moving. I mean, you know, their success will be my success. Uh, if, you know, I, who said it? Mari Batali, I think, said that. If you have a really talented sous chef, would you rather lose them to competitor or would you want to open up another restaurant and move him to, you know, executive chef position or partnership position so you have a smart person next to you? And obviously, I chose the latter as well. You know, I'd rather keep a talent uh, closer by than lose it and make myself a headache of having a very talented competitor. <laughs> uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather invest on those guys and, uh, you know, have multiple of restaurants that we can all run together as a team. So that's one of those things. And uh, Gary Henry, who's the... Um, uh, CEO and uh, president of uh, Schlitter Bond. I'm sure you heard heard of that place. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful right. friend, and uh, yeah. he gave me an amazing lesson where he told me, "Hey, take care of your people. Your asset depends on your people, and the human asset is the most important asset you can ever have." And he is 100% right about it. I mean, his business is fantastic. His business model is fantastic. It's a family-owned, operated, uh, amazing business in uh, Texas, and uh, it's uh, famous for worldwide for their, you know, pool designs and uh, you know, uh, water traction design. But he relies heavily on his family and his uh, extended family, who are staffs. So you know, I learned that from him, uh, and when I see that, when you care about your staff as much as your own business, how business flourish because those staff care as much as you do. Uh, so when you see a very good example, why would you deviate, you know? Uh, whereas uh, you see other companies who's uh, completely based on profits and they'll let people go. You know, it doesn't work that way, I'm sorry. You know, it just, you know, and yes, you know, just some people tell me, hey, you know, during summertime, you guys are on a slower downturn. Why don't you cut people out? Uh, that way, you you know you can maintain profitability. Well, they got families. You know, they're they're yeah. not a staff that I don't know. I mean, they, they a lot of these guys work for me for a long time. I know their family. I know their kids. Uh, you know, just because I'm having a slower time doesn't necessarily mean I need to cut them off because they got you know they got family to feed at at their home. So. You know, we always uh, chuckle, uh, my wife, Christina, she's very understanding. You know, we make money during spring and we burn it all during summertime <laughs> on a payroll. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we make money during fall and then we burn it all during the December, January slow turn. But, you know, it is what it is. But that's one reason I think why they are very loyal to me and then they stay and then they help me out when they need to help me out. So, you know, on the long run, I may not make a whole lot of fortune right now, like, you know, some, some corporate restaurants may be, but I think I'm going to have, a, on a long run, I'll have amazing staff and uh, amazingly loyal people. And, you know, when the chance comes, 
I can pounce on it with a talented pool of people. So that is, I love the philosophy. It's like it's it's uh, not only the unique part of it, but the that's pro- that is exactly why you have six restaurants that kind of like stay just mm. because you said those people care the same way. Um, I mean, and it's not. You can just tell by talking to you. It's not all. You don't open these things for money. No. I mean, obviously, you need to make money. And you want to <clears> make <throat> money. That's yeah. not. That's not what I'm saying there. Like, of course, everybody wants to make money, and be mm-hmm. successful. It's like, no, you could cut them like like a lot of other people do. Mm-hmm. But no, I'll take the hit, hit, and we'll pay them and keep them around. <clears throat> Absolutely, I think that's important. Uh, when you do that consistently, I think it shows on the staff morale, and uh, when people are happy. Uh, I think they tend to turn out much better product uh, and uh, when they do it they do it with a sense of pride uh, so for me that's more important than making a quick bucks right now so, so what made you want to get into the restaurant business in the first place like I, I said the ring on your fingers that, that A&M yeah. ring mm-hmm. so you came over here what made you want to start in the restaurant <laughs> industry well so I was working at a local restaurant actually as a student and because that's the easiest job for any college kids to get a job I guess in town and I didn't think too much of it I uh, just needed, needed a quick bucks right and then um, I happened to start to see the charm of restaurant business it's not food it's the people again it kind of goes back to my business philosophy of uh, making more business so I can have an opportunity for my people to you know move up uh, and giving them an opportunity to grow Uh, meeting people was the fascinating part of the restaurant like an airport where it connects two places where people normally shouldn't really go Uh, you know it it can connect people to go to other places Um, like a like in that analogy restaurant is the same way it's a it's bringing two groups of people or three groups of people who otherwise would not have met you got to eat so it brings them to the table you know it brings them to the table and it make you get together and they eat together uh and that's fascinating for me uh i got to meet so many people through restaurant business matter of fact i met my wife through restaurant business my closest business partners and uh, family friends i met them through restaurant i met kimberly because of the restaurant (laughs) business obviously so I just love that fascination of meeting people. Uh, I guess I am people person. Uh, which is funny because you said earlier that <clears throat> you didn't have a lot of social skills, which is, this is the, the what I kind of wanted to get to was how did you, like, you said you weren't social, but then all these, like, I think that hung, you made all these Well, I, I think because I missed out on being you know going to the parties and all that because mm-hmm. I was literally working and even during school I was working full-time and I worked full-time so I had no social time but I made up some of that social skill through interacting with the people who come to our restaurant so but, your social time was like if you're a waiter or you're exactly work, as a chef yeah, yeah, yeah. as a chef doing a table touch you know you know visiting with the clients okay. and uh, my business partner all of them actually became my business partner because they were at one time my regulars all of them 100 <laughs> percent of them awesome. yeah. so <clears throat> i you know I, I just felt like you know what if i can nurture that relationship uh from you know from a chef to a customer if i do the right thing those customer will become your friend and if you're really lucky at it it becomes a lifetime friends you know so yeah. my business partners and Obviously, my life partner, my spouse, you know, is a life friend. So I, I think that was a fascinating part of a business, uh, and that's what's still keeping me going. If it wasn't for a restaurant, I would not have met so many awesome athletes, you know, that everybody just wished they can, you know, just get a glimpse of, you know, musicians, you know, movie stars. I, I got to meet so many of them because they all have to eat and when they're in Brown Hill Station I am one of the choices where people will have to come and eat uh, not that they have to come and eat at my places yeah. if they want to eat out they have to go to some sort of restaurant so I'm just one of those restaurants so my uh, colleagues and uh, my uh, counterparts at other restaurants 
all equally have some amazing stories about meeting some superstars and athletes because people have to eat <laughs> you know this yeah. is you know it's a simple fact so um, i think that's what what charms me to continue on at the restaurant i just wonder who i'm going to see who i'm going to you know go across today it just it's fascinating part so when you meet some of these like famous like that well, you want to say famous people but the people people wish they could meet mm-hmm. um have you developed with your people skills that you developed are you nervous to go talk to them uh, i can tell you sitting here doing this podcast there's some people that i've had on where i've been like man i'm really nervous to talk to this guy but <sighs> as far as you like you get to talk to so many different people uh, i guess i do get nervous if i'm like starstruck how about that way? You yeah. know, so, you know, if it was like a Jimbo Fisher for the first time, I, I knew who he was. <laughs> I seen him on TV, right? And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Jimbo Fisher. You know, like, how do I even go say hi? You know, and, you know, luckily, uh, Coach Fisher actually approached me like, oh, are you the chef? I'm like, yes. You know, and it's so much easier <laughs> when, when somebody, somebody, you know, approached you, you know, approach you first and then start talk to you. And, uh, of course, he speaks so fast. I could, I could not understand half the thing he was saying because he was such a smart and fast talker and i'm just like just dazed you know i'm like what did he just say i don't remember anything he said right now but you know he was very much focused you know and uh, he you know didn't matter if uh athletic director scott woodward was waiting on him he he was just keep talking to me for about 10 minutes i'm like well you know coach is great but i think people are waiting on you you need to move on to the other guests oh okay i'll come back and you know he he talked to everybody and he came back he's such a great guy um but same thing with uh, Johnny Menzel. I mean, Johnny Menzel, you know, he has all these uh, off, the, off the field drama that people only talks about. But the thing is, I got to know Johnny at a different level where he came to our restaurant with his family. And you get to see people in their true nature with yeah. the family who yeah. are most comfortable with. Amazing, loving person. He is amazingly loving person. He loves his family more than anything. He loves his friend more than anything. And he's been so, so, um, you know, well-behaving to our staff. That says a lot. You know, he's nice to me, but he's nice to our staff. That says a lot more to me than anything else, right? So we get to see people at different light. Uh, You know, I got to meet President Bush, the 41st. And what a wonderful, everybody know how wonderful guy he was. But seeing him holding Barbara's hand throughout the entire dinner, except when he was cutting his lamb chop. <laughs> I'm just like, he really is an awesome guy, you know, because they've been married for so long and the love's still there, you know. So you get to witness stuff like that, you know, meet, meeting some amazing musicians, um, you know, and they are so humble. They're not, they're not all, you know, stuck up. And, you know, you have a different perspective on these musicians as well. So it's, it's fun. It's really fun just doing my business and um yeah do i get nervous yeah of course i get nervous because uh these people are superstar on their own right or some of them got bodyguards with the guns you know but uh <laughs> but when they come to restaurant good thing is they typically treat their chefs pretty well because they don't want you know they don't want any funky thing going you on with good their food, food right, you right? Good food. so we typically do get very well treated i think uh you know chef lampo or chef uh, Chef Wei Beckman and Bartman, those guys will all agree. I think chefs are typically celebrated within a restaurant, but the people who really needs to be celebrated is those dishwashers, those uh, servers who's bring the food, washing the dish, you know, making sure the glass is clean and all that. So there are a lot of unsung heroes who really need to get their credit for it. Uh, so again, um, it's it's fascinating field field of business to work here. Well, I've, I've noticed like the reason I ask that is because I've noticed when you talk to people and the more and more I do this this part of it where I get to visit with somebody like yourself you know that it is we're all just humans like we're just regular people that just happen to have a talent to do something you know they may have just a talent and they entertain us Mm -hmm. and so then we get starstruck and we hold them up on this other level but they're really just like like you said, Jimbo Fisher. It just sounds like somebody that you would run into, like a friend. Oh, that, like a home. really nice uncle or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Fast-talking uncle. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's why I asked that question. And I, I kind of want to know more about this 
Porsche stuff that you okay. have. I want to know about this because I see it like it seems like when you have free time, yeah, you get you get to go see all these <laughs> awesome cars for one, and you get to drive them sometimes. Yes. You get to see them. Where where did that whole car addiction thing come from? Uh, well, I think we're all guys, so I think we naturally come <laughs> up with something like that: airplanes and cars. I I, I told so many people, and uh, people who's close to me know. If I was not in a restaurant business, I'll be in automotive or aviation somehow. Uh, just because on my free time, that's all I search like aviation stuff and car stuff and aviation as well. Yeah. So, like, my romantic getaway to Seattle for 36 hours with my wife, with my children, and my parents' house, we went to the Boeing factory and uh, aviation museum. <laughs> I love my wife for being very understanding. And uh, when we went to Atlanta uh, for a two-day trip, uh, she let me spend entire day at the Porsche Center uh, where there's a track where you can race a Porsche with, uh, with the yeah. instructor. And she was just at the gift shop just watching me drive. Again, very, very loving wife that I have, an understanding <laughs> wife. But um, I love cars and airplanes, and I think most guys are a similar way. They're kind of wired that way. But um, I don't know where it started. I do remember one of the first things that I drew as a kid was an airplane and a car. And um, i I'd just been fascinated with it. You know, just how does that thing work? You know, how, how does that wheel turn? You know, how does that make that kind of sound and heat? Um, but my free time that very little free time that I get I try to maximize it with my family and the things that I like so we get on an airplane and go somewhere right or we'll drive a car to somewhere together and um, if we're gonna drive somewhere oh, well, there's different types of transportation method I guess a very comfortable uh, wallowy minivan sometimes that's a great choice they are some, pretty awesome yeah. the new ones yeah, are pretty I, I sweet i love my minivan yeah I, I do. you have one yeah i do oh does it? i do have a minivan let's <laughs> see uh, this is so cool but and, and my porsche friends just look at me like you gotta be kidding i'm like no, no it's great with the children you know you don't have to worry about them you know banging someone else's car when they try to open the door uh but then again you know i always dreamed about having a porsche um I first saw the Porsche back in 1996 in July. Uh, I think it was July 2nd or 3rd, to be honest with you. It was a Pikes Peak Hill uh, climb, which is the second oldest race, motorsport race in America after Indy 500. But um, that's when I saw the 1996 Porsche 911 Turbo, and I was just mesmerized by the shape and the location of the engine, I'm like, what the heck is this? I have never seen Porsche in my life until that day, actually. So it actually did really well on the race, and uh, that's kind of when my, I don't know, heart got sunk onto the uh, Porsche, along with the Ferrari. So in my house, <laughs> there was a black Porsche 911 and a red Testarossa on the on the on the wall as a poster. And some of my buddies had a some naughty looking ladies on the you know on their wall uh, <laughs> some girl from a Baywatch I think uh, but they looked at me like you're weird dude like like why don't you why don't you like this girl I'm like oh she's pretty and all but I think the car looks better and a lot of my buddies actually do agree cars don't bitch <laughs> they don't complain <laughs> uh, they don't ask for a handbag or things like that so I do love my cars um, and lucky for me that i have a lot of friends who are petrol heads and uh they like cars and uh they like airplanes and they like trains so we we have a lot of common things to talk about and uh recently for about past one year there's been a aggieland porsche club uh there, there are quite a lot of porsche drivers actually who doesn't come out a lot because they don't drive their Porsche every day. But you know, we're finding these people who's hiding under the rock and they're bringing them out and they're making sure they're gonna bring their Porsches out to a little fun run through the country road or go to Houston for Porsche meets. And you know, last year was a Porsche's 70th birthday, so every Porsche dealership in the world was celebrating a birthday party. So like, hey, free birthday party, let's go crash. So we all <laughs> went there together as a group. I mean, it was a blast. So that's how we kind of spent our time. And of course, my kids were there uh, because one, they love their Porsche as well because 
they see their dad loves Porsche and you know Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree so they're, they're into cars a lot and uh, we go to Formula One race together uh, oh, we'll go to, yeah cool. we'll go to the automotive museums together um, you know our favorite movie together is uh, watching cars you know so you know who's Mater and who's you know Rusty's <laughs> and all that stuff I'm like those are all fake it's, it doesn't exist uh, but you know it's, it's fun uh, so I, I if I was not in a restaurant business I guess I would have really been on some sort of a race team or automotive uh, company like working with your hands on it for sure or, I don't know I mean, do you do your own work on your cars I do change my oil I do change filters I done a lot of work on my generators for my food trucks so I do know certain things but then again I am very risk averse person and I, I'm not trained to do certain things That's so blowing my mind whenever so you... so I don't try to touch things that I don't know how to but engine oils, absolutely. I've done that before many, yeah. many times. Uh, changing filters, yeah, changing light bulbs. Come on, you know, somebody got to do that. That's not an issue. Um, I detail my own car. I wash my own car, not, not through some, you know, machines. So, um, but uh, do I know how to overhaul engine? No. I have amazing level of respect for mechanics uh, who knows how to take apart an engine and put it back together. Uh, some people are gifted. I'm not. Uh, so I don't know what I would have done maybe because I was good with a number maybe I would have worked for I don't know Porsche finance you know or whatever you know, <laughs> try to come up with some financial products yeah. uh, or maybe work for a race team you know who knows you know how to get the you know monetary uh, funding for the race team to uh, succeed but I don't know I always uh, think about that, those those little wild dreams and uh I try to go to every single race I can if uh, my time allows just to listen to the engine and see the pit crew working on it and most of the pit crews are actually engineers uh, they really they, yeah they actually work on the cars and set up and then on the race day they happen to be just changing tires but they're not tire changing people they, they actually work on cars so it's really fascinating to see the motorsports yeah that oh i've been to i've been to a couple of races like just some nascar races and mm -hmm. stuff and yeah up in fort worth and, and, yeah you just see like, my brother runs a snap-on dealership and so we got to go in the booth, mm -hmm. booth meet the drivers That's all awesome. that good yeah. stuff walk in the pits and everything and uh, i mean it it was really interesting to see it's not just like there's way more to it than just them going in circles no, and changing the tires just, as yeah, fast as they can. It's, like it's not like there's, there's, a, there's lot a, of, a lot of math, a lot of a lot of work. Oh, uh, like I mean, those drivers are crazy good, yeah. and it takes like stamina. They I have. mean, and yeah. it's like the the minute of detail that that means winning or or yeah. middle of the pack even. <laughs> you know, you you see these races. You know, the the qualifying. You know, who's gonna who's gonna take which position. Some of these uh, positions are separated by one thousandth of a second. I mean, one thousandth. I mean, that is basically a tie, you know. But you no, know, they somehow know the difference, where it's a one thousandth yeah. of second difference, and it's so minute, but it really makes a difference on uh, win or lose. And I think that's what's so fascinating about it too, because um, you know, food industry is same. I mean, food is food, right? I mean, you know, there's there's, there's so many only so many ways you can cook up a you know dish but it's the little details you know those little minute details how well do you execute it to differentiate your restaurant over others um, so I think again motorsports is fascinating because I do have to deal with that a lot they they time things and uh, they they look at other guys and you know compare notes and see how can we do better Huh. Restaurant same way, you know, we're, we're all friends within our industry. Uh, we all want us to exceed uh, and succeed uh, But we also want to exceed other person's uh, Talent by coming up with something innovative method to cook and things like that, which is all part of motorsports, too So it's I think it kind of echoes really well within within our industry So but you said something so interesting back there about you're a very risk adverse person, mm -hmm. and that's why I was saying it blew my mind because you've got you're a business owner. Like yeah. that's the biggest risk that you can take in life, True. just about. True. But you said when you like you're very confident in your skills that you have, so like you're gonna take risk with your skills. So like a calculated risk. Of, yeah, it's it's a, it, you know there, there's there's an acceptable risk, right? Yeah. Uh, 
I, I don't do gamble because it's so risky. Me either. <laughs> I, mean, I do not. Just, g- I don't like gambling at all. It's it's <laughs> it's uh, you're not gonna win. House always wins. Uh, they're the lucky people, one in a billion, who's gonna win it. For, so so for me, that is high risk. So why am I gonna do it, right? Uh, because I'm a risk averse person, I do try to. I do try to over plan and over analyze on certain things. How can we make the most successful chance of making a restaurant go? And it doesn't always work because you know the, it, life is life of chances. You know there there's, there's chances that we're not gonna do well. There are chances that we're gonna do much better than we thought. Uh, but point is, we have to continuously develop our service and product to to meet people's uh, demands. And if we can consistently do that, we'll do it. And for me, that is acceptable risk, you know. But if, I don't know, if somebody would told me like, hey, you know, you should open up a restaurant in the middle of the cornfield and you build it, they'll come. I'll say, you're crazy. (laughs) You know, it's not field of, you know, dream is, come on, it doesn't work that way. When do you decide to pull the trigger if you've got so many plans? Like, when do you decide that this is what I'm going with because this is the best way? Right. It... It's really a luck, right? The timing has to be there. Uh, You know, I wanted to do my own restaurant uh, back in 2005. I already knew I wanted to do my own restaurant, but I did not know how because, one, I don't have enough money to build your own restaurant. But I planned. I had a certain idea of how I wanted to run it and a certain idea of a concept. And then luckily my business partner, you know, uh, back then a regular, asked me a question. What do you want to do? I said, I want to have my own restaurant. Well, can you tell me more about it? And I kind of told him what I thought about doing it. Right, without 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 really trying to pitch it because I did not know how wealthy he was. Uh, And then he said, well. (laughs) You're just talking to a friend. Yeah, let me help you. I said, sure, whatever. Like (laughs) people say, let me help you. Yeah. Let me help you. What? $10,000. No, it's going to take a lot of money to do it. Except he actually had a lot of money to do it. So I just got really lucky on the timing. Uh, But I always keep tell them uh, same thing with a food truck. Uh, When I became the first food truck, gourmet food truck, as you know it these days, I was the first in town, and several people say, oh, man, I, I thought about that, too. I, I had that idea as well. Well, having an idea in your head doesn't do anything. you got to enact. you got to plan, and you got to enact for it. Um, everybody have a great idea, but how do you execute it to make it a reality is completely different, uh, different thing. So whenever the food truck idea came up about two, 2008, 2009, uh, I start doing a lot of research, going to LA, going to you know Southern California, New York, where these uh, food truck scenes were developing, Austin, and see what they were doing good, what they are not doing well. You know, basically you see them. I say, hey, you know, I would do something different. You know, hey, that's a really great idea. Maybe I'll simulate. Um, and we did a lot of different concept research, and then I came up with what I came up with, and I enacted, and I luckily was first person to do that in town and there was there were you know set of a challenges because of legality wise you know the city never had a code for a food truck so i had to go oh, and you wow. know had to had to ask them hey can you make a you know variance on a city code where it would it would be acceptable to run a food truck i mean we had to go through all that but luckily city understood and they made a variance on it um but when these people say like oh man i had that idea too you know uh, well, idea doesn't make you money. You know, you, no. you got you to patent no. it, or you got to you got to come up with the real product. And um, that's where that risk adverse thing kind of is funny because a lot of people have the idea. Mm-hmm. It's really scary to pull that trigger. Well, but again, when you have plan and you run many simulation on it then it becomes an acceptable risk. You know, when you just have an idea, it's 100% risk, you know, because you don't know if it's going to go well or not. But you measure it against other people who's already doing a successful food truck and see, you know, knowing that, one, you can make as good or better food than they are. Two, uh, understand what the cost, you know, cost of the food truck and operational overheads are. And you start to make that 
work uh, and you start writing a business plan and then you can simulate okay at what level of a you know daily sales do I need at what location to make this happen that that study alone took one year because I had to look at different location traffic counts and all that and once we had that it became an acceptable risk where I say okay I can pull this pull this trigger and I think I have a very good chance of making it if I don't, luckily I have a backup plan where I can sell the truck and I can minimize total loss. You went that far too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you have to. You have to. You you always have to have a backup plan. So, it worked. Lucky for me. <laughs> but <laughs> then again, I wasn't surprised because the all the timing, the whole how the whole these uh, food truck movement was uh, bubbling up. I, I knew I was gonna ride the wave. So that worked out really well, and it was an acceptable risk that I was willing to take. Uh, you know, there was no bank loan to you know deal with, so it was good. Um, doing Urban Table was a much bigger risk, you know, really? because uh, I mean, think about it. It's a you know, it's a historically underserviced area. Yeah, there's no other restaurant. No, there's but nothing us. over here. Yeah, but then again, that shows an opportunity because there was no other restaurant in the past will be the only restaurant but at what point do you do this i was approached with this project three years ago and three years ago i told them there's no way you're gonna make money there just because there was nothing but over the three years you start to see all these rooftops that's being developed and being built within a half mile distance that's when things change i'm like okay now there are more people living nearby maybe this is a good time and a lot of people were building restaurants uh, by the cap rock area <clears throat> and then you know now a lot of restaurants are being built around jones crossing and it's great i think those are a fantastic location but i wanted to own the land and a building i did not want to lease anymore so my partner Paige and i said you know what <clears throat> it is acceptable risk to be in this location and build a restaurant and if the restaurant fails, which we felt like, no, it wasn't going to fail, but even if it did fail, we can still own the building, we can still own the lot, and we can rent it to somebody who wants to run a restaurant. So there was a, some sort of a you know, fallback backup plans on it. Yeah. So again, it became an acceptable you know, risk. And then once we found a tenant who was going to go occupy the vacant, uh, vacant spot next to us, it became even more acceptable risk because now tenant is unloading some of that pressure of uh, you know mortgage loans, so it became a little bit more lucrative, and uh, other businesses were uh, committing into building more buildings. Matter of fact, four buildings are coming up within this center, so that became a little bit more lucrative and a little bit more acceptable. So you know we were able to pull the trigger in a you know and many many. Uh, thankful notes and a blessing notes to my partner Paige who committed you know this financial adventure with me because uh, she believed in me and uh, my way of uh, thanking her back is ba making sure our business uh, is successful and uh, we can pay her back and then hopefully we can build another urban table you know down the road somewhere and I don't know where you know but somewhere else um, so we always work with the risk scenarios i mean every operation same way and you know even if it was already open you know even veritas you know we look at our risk assessment every every day because you know the, there's a challenge on an upscale dining scene right now yeah okay, there's a let's say three years ago there was only four high-end restaurants. three years you know has have gone by in 2019 there are probably about 10 or 11 high-end restaurants so the competition is pretty fierce, you know, and we are established name, but because of the new restaurant entries, people do want to try new places. Yeah, and I don't blame yeah. them. I absolutely don't blame them. It's, it's a completely natural thing. But we still got to be able to keep our composures and keep our quality and keep our service level high. How do we do it? You know, what kind of risk are we, you know, you know dealing with, you know, financially, you know, are we there or not? But we made a movement where we're going to invest more into the restaurant so we just did a little update on our interior furnishings uh are changing i'm still waiting on my chairs but we're changing our <laughs> chairs as well so we're we're updating our interior uh and then you know we're aggressively releasing new seasonal menu uh we're not going to sit on 
old menu like some other you know some other restaurants yeah, yeah. no I, I say we were always known for changing menu based on seasonality so slowness uh, on the business won't affect us we got to do what we got to do keep worrying about our four walls and making sure we're doing what we're supposed to do so um, things are going well um, you know people see that you know we are continuously be uh, relevant uh, within the higher uh, high-end uh, facility even though there are other really good competitive uh, restaurants out there we're still doing, we're still uh, pulling uh, clientele who understands and uh, believe in us so that's all good news um, you know and all these caterings that we're doing because we are continuously making a name for high quality uh, high detail focus uh, restaurant tours slash caterer we are gaining more traction on those I mean you know we're doing 750 to 1000 people catering that we never even fathomed that we were able to do back in the <laughs> old days now we do that successfully uh, and those are you know financially very handsome uh, reward uh, and having that consistent relationship with the association of former student and 12th man foundation and president's office on all these many uh, lucrative caterings it brings the right clientele back to our restaurant because again we're projecting not only texas a&m's image uh, but also our restaurants because we are the one who's catering it so you know it, it's not just some simple job i'll just drop off food no we we try to execute that well where people will say this is the best food we have ever been catered uh, and many people do agree a lot of people say i have never had steak this good on a cater site you know because a lot of people kind of assume the oh boy you know it's, it's all <laughs> yeah. site catering yeah, yeah. and it will be mediocre steak but we come up with a really great steak so we tell them if you think this was great can you imagine how much better it will be at our own restaurant and it really is you know we cook much better at our restaurant sure but because we think about all the details and timing and such our food out on the off-site catering is just really good so again we always try to say to not miss any opportunity to win your client because every business that we do every meetings that we do every charity event that we do is an opportunity to capture those uh, customer in the future uh, and then if we do a lot of good things those people will remember our name and a brand and then they'll you know come back to us and support us and build all it, you build your brand by your product and yeah. your quality and the details like you've said details over and over again I, I'm really curious to know how like I've always there, there's a thing that says you can't you can't really multitask you can only focus on really one, you're doing one thing or you're bouncing back and forth between several things because you can't give your attention to both like different things at the same time. However, in your situation, you've got these six places going. Yeah. And in order for them to be successful and your pa I can like just sitting here looking at you, you've got a passion for what you've created mm -hmm. and all these different places and the people that work for you. And then on top of that being in the chamber, how do you give 100% to all these different things to make sure that they run good? I Well, simple answer is I can't. Uh, it, it, I can't. I try. I try. And uh, I have to rely on the team to add wherever I'm having a deficit. But how do you, So I know you, you, and you talked about the team and, and that stuff, but how do you oversee the team? What measures do you oversee those team, or do you just have complete trust in? in oh no, I, I constantly oversee them. That's uh, what, yeah, that's what yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 I trust them, but there is no complete trust because I don't even trust my own work. Sometimes I gotta have <laughs> double, double checking of my own work. Uh, you always have an oversight. Uh, you always have to have a safety net. Uh, you have a multiple people. So whenever I message something, some you know change or task. I don't send it to one person because that one person may not check that message for say one hour but I want something done right away I sent it to three people I said let me know when you get this and reply to me then sometimes I get two replies simultaneously but sometimes I'll get one of them but I know one got done uh, and then I can hold that person accountable for and whoever have not replied to me I'll follow up did you not get my message oh I got it why did you not reply so we always do have that oversight and i really do not sleep that much a day about three to four hours a day <laughs> you look good 
I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they know, my staff know, and some of my staffs are similar to me. They text me at 2 a.m. Some ideas they mm-hmm. have, they'll run it by at 2 a.m. And I reply right back to them because they know I don't sleep till 3. So wow. um, You don't sleep at 3? What time do you get up? About 6, typically. So Really? How long have you done this? About five years. So you get used to it. You get used to it because... Uh, it actually happened because of my kids. Uh, it started with my kids because they wake up really early. So I <laughs> chose, well, you know what? There's no point of try to sleep in. There, there, we haven't had a sleep in, you know, I don't know when. Uh, one chance that I had a sleep in was when I dropped off my kids to my parents' house. And then I told you I went to Seattle to go to Boeing Factory. And it was a 7 a.m. Uh, wake up call to go see a Boeing factory at 8 a.m. So, no, we haven't slept in. Uh, but your body get acclimated to it. But, you know, going back to your point was you have to trust them, but you have to be there. You know, you delegate tasks, but you have to follow through. Make sure it was done properly, not because you don't trust them. It's because everything falls on you eventually. I am the person who's accountable for all my restaurant's action, and my worst associate is my representation. So I don't want to just be unaccountable for their mistake. I want to prevent it. It's so much easier to prevent a problem than fixing it afterward. Uh, you know, matter of fact, today was a good example. Uh, there was a one guest who did not finish their artichoke dip. And I noticed it, my server didn't. I said, did you not notice he didn't finish his artichoke dip? Well, yeah, well, did you ask why? I said, no, I, did. I didn't. I look at it, I said, it seems fine, but you know, you need to double check why. There's, there has to be a reason for people to not finish their food. And you know, he asked, had the manager go check, and he said, oh, nothing was wrong. I, was, I just wanted to make sure I wanted to have enough room for my meal. Bullshit. You're a young guy. <laughs> there's, there's no <laughs> way. So, you know, I probe and I probe and probe. And he said, well, I mean, you know, dip was good, but the chips were broken down a little bit too much. So it was a little difficult for me to scoop it up. I said, thanks for letting me know. So, again, I do trust my staff, but sometimes... They don't have that skill to probe a right answer out of the issues. So if I didn't do that, and if my manager didn't do that, and it, and of course I come to you know come to dish, I say you know what, I, you know you're absolutely right, and uh, if you're not hundred percent satisfied, you shouldn't pay for it. It's fine. So we come to ticket. So here's the thing. Now, this is hypothetical, but if I did not intervene. And that person still got a check for the artichoke dip that he wasn't completely satisfied with. There's a chance that he might give me just four star out of five star, you know, on on a review. And he might have said something bad about the artichoke dips. Now that I comped it, if he still says something bad about it, but at least I have a conscience that he didn't have to pay for it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So I can sleep easy at night and I'll just think he's a jerk. <laughs> and I'll say, hey, you didn't pay for it. You know, shush. <laughs> but, um, but by preventing what could be a uh, you know, catastrophe, one, I, I feel better about it. And two, I'm teaching my staff how to take care of you know, client satisfaction. There are a few people that have become a really good friend of mine because I caught a mistake and I owned up to it. And I think Americans in general like those kind of people who are accountable for their act and uh, you know keep their mouths, uh, keep their words. Uh, you know, they don't like flip floppers. So, you know, I told them I said, you know what, doesn't matter who cooked it. Buck stops here. It's my fault. I own up to it. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And those people were impressed that I didn't throw somebody under the bus. I did not blame somebody. I said, no, no, it's, it's all it's all my fault. So I'll take care of it and. That was a start of a wonderful uh, family friendship that we got. So that echoes on all my action, I think. Uh, I do trust them, but if I can catch a mistake, then it prevents an issue going forward. Yeah. And if I don't catch a mistake, it builds confidence on me. 
you know and there are some people that i really don't have to look after because they do such a great job for over 12 years yeah there's no need for me to nanny them and they they really are as good or better than me those people i just show leadership and you know how to how to how to do things i lead by example and then you know they go along with me but there are some uh, some of the younger staff who doesn't have experience you know the, the depth of experience yeah because they're just younger those are the ones that I have to follow up. Well, they're not going to think to ask about the chips. You're going to be like, "Are the, they said the dip is fine?" Like, I really, yeah. I asked them, the yeah. "Dip is fine," but you're like, which, which, "No, I want to you know, know what yeah. what's really going yeah. on." Logically, the, it they should finish this. So, those are the you know those are those little I guess uh, lack of experience that shows, and uh, you have to have an eye to catch it, and uh, that's that's where I keep telling my managers, "You got to follow through. You can't just." say hey go ask your table if everything was okay hi was everything okay <laughs> people don't really ask to ask you know my yeah. friend actually because most of the time when you're sitting <laughs> when you're sitting there most of the time you're like i mean as being somebody who served it can be like yeah yeah i mean yeah, and I'll, most people do that fine. way and uh, my friend actually got a very funny story uh, he was going to the walmart and uh, there's a person in the door who greets people hey how you doing? Welcome to Walmart. You know, have a great day. And or how's your day? Whatever. You know, they this it's it's a automatically written up script. They were just saying it, right? And he he just got annoyed by it because it wasn't genuine, <laughs> right? So one day he asked, like, How, how's it going? And he said, I'm gonna rob it. I'm gonna rob rob your store. And he said, That's great. Have a great day. <laughs> he wasn't listening. He wasn't he wasn't listening to what the customer was saying, and uh, it was so funny for him. He actually shared that story with me, because a lot of people just say what they were asked to say, but they're really not doing it with certain input or you know meaning. So you know, I just want to make sure our staff doesn't get caught on to that. You know, oh, make sure you go, you know table touch. How you doing? How's everything? Come on, don't be a robot. You know, ask. You know, look at the situation. Look at, look. You know what they have. You know, did they drink all their drinks? You know, then let's refill them up. You know, did did they not eat all their food? You know, why not? Find out. You know, make sure make sure they leave happy because otherwise they're gonna say something bad about us, and that's gonna potentially affect your business. Yeah, it makes because, it makes them more money. Right, it makes them more money. Exactly. Because the more attentive it's, they are it's, to people. It's um, you know, we try to tell them it's not a waiting job. You're you're renting uh, five tables out of my business and you're you're running your own enterprise you're selling a product and you get a commission called tip you know at the end of the day i mean you got to pitch it you got to sell it you got to know your product and just like car salesmen you got to know what you're selling i mean it's, it's so funny like because i know my car so well i literally <laughs> laugh they don't know a technical term uh, they don't know where things are. I just like literally say, "You don't know where that is, do you?" Like, oh, it's it's my second, you know, second car. To say. I'm like, dude, you gotta know your stuff. Come on, you know, don't don't try to bullshit, you know, because uh, you know, a Asian guy doesn't know car. No, like, I know more about this car than you do because I research. And most consumers these days who go to these uh, car dealerships, they know more about that particular car than the you know car dealer himself because they search and search and search. I don't know. I just try to let my staff know, hey, you just don't take it as a job. You got to take it as a, you know, you got to take it as an opportunity and a practice field for whatever you're going to do in the future because you might be selling a $22 million airplane, you know, then if, you know, if you're going to sell you 22, better. yeah, you better know your product and you better also know how to read your clients, you know, mine. You just don't know. You got. You could be selling a diamond, you know, but you still gotta know your product, and you still gotta know how how to read your, you know, client's body language. You know, what are they looking for? You know, whatever. It's it's a great opportunity for young, you know, young staffer uh, to get that experience, how to read people's mind and how to people's body language and all that. Oh, that's I mean, such a fun thing to do. It, it is. really is it such is. a fun thing to and do. And you got to know when to have a, you know, more casual conversation or, you know, what we call silent service. If they're having a business meeting, I rarely talk to them. I don't even go greet. You know, I, I, I just 
nod and then come and just make sure their water's refilled and make sure their tea's refilled because they're doing business conference call. I don't want to be bothered when I'm having a business conference call. So we don't bother them, you know, but if they come with the family, with the, you know, two little kids, I'll go there and try to entertain the children, you know, and, and parents like that because I like when my servers entertain my children, you know, like, hey, it's great, you know. So it's just something that we got to constantly try to teach them. Uh, we got amazing staff. I think that genuinely they're amazing people. I already want to come work for you. <laughs> you I'm a hard it? guy to work for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like, well, sold. I'm just going to come work for this guy. I, I'm a hard guy to work for. Because you tell me I can own five tables right now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But Sweet. I, I demand a lot. I do. Because, uh, because uh, again, the worst associate is a reflection of me. So I don't want to be embarrassed. Expectations are not bad. Uh, They're not bad to have on people. And, that you know, that's, that's what I, we constantly, and I, I can say, like, we go to one grocery store here in town, mm -hmm. and we really enjoy the people. Yep. Like the worker, they take pride in what they do. Yep. Go to another one, they don't really care so much about hiring anything like that. And we don't like going there for that specific reason. And that's it. So, I mean, it makes a difference to hold that expectation, that standard. So, I know you got to get out of here, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's, what, three minutes past yeah. the time. Thanks for doing this. Is there anything, no like, do you want to list your restaurants again, where to find them and everything before yeah, sure. we shut this uh, well, down? Well, yeah, I mean, the easiest easiest way to find list of my restaurant is actually visit my website www.cheftay.com c-h-e-f-t-a-i.com and uh, there will be a list of restaurants and uh, if you click on it it will have a uh, you know map link google uh, google map link and uh, menus and specials and things like that but uh, yeah if you're in a downtown Bryan area Madden's Casual Gourmet located inside the old Bryan market is fantastic great place to shop and great place to you know dine out and then uh, if you're in a uh, Central College Station, Paolo's Italian Kitchen and uh, uh, Veritas Wine and Bistro, they're both actually on University Drive facing each other uh, next to the Hilton Hotel. Uh, and then uh, if you're down in South College Station, Urban Table is the hottest new place to go out. <laughs> and uh, it really is a great, uh, it really you know, is cool. great, cool place to be, yeah. uh, especially with the upstairs uh, covered patio overlooking Texas a and campus on the horizon. It's really neat. And then if you're on campus, uh, our food trucks actually by Zachary, new Zachary Engineering uh, Education Complex, the brand spanking new building yeah. uh, on the on University Drive. Our food truck and a few of a uh, few of our fellow food truck guys actually have a spot there. Uh, so during the fall semester and a spring semester, we're there every day for lunch um, and it's it's a fun place to come and uh, eat a very unique, uh, you know. Asian inspire burgers or rice bowls. Uh, it's it's a fun place to be. So again, we always try to bring some fun, unique uh, things to what we do. If you're not having fun, what what's the point of working? So yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna let you get back to that fun, no man. Problem. Thanks for doing no this. No problem, chef. man. I appreciate it. Thank you so 